Citations Gaming Enthusiasts, George Mario Nerd here, and I'm happy to announce that the channel just passed 200 subscribers! Yay! Woohoo! Whoa! Yay! Oh yeah! That's a good thing! Yeah, I'm celebrating! Woohoo! So, to celebrate this milestone, I thought I'd finally make this video that's been in production limbo since it was meant to be used for my 100 subscribers celebration, but, um, that didn't work out. I put a lot of thought into this list, and it was very difficult to order these games because I'm notoriously terrible at choosing favourites and preferences. However, I was able to put together a list of mostly Switch exclusive games based on how impactful and fun they were for me. Of course, these are all very much my own personal opinions based on my own experiences, and not at all a list of the best games on the Switch, and I have some rather unconventional favourites to talk about here. I tend to have more memorable, positive experiences with games that weren't part of existing franchises that I've been playing throughout other generations that have historically been my favourites. So with that, a huge thank you goes out to each and every one of my subscribers, and without further ado, let's get on with the video! My experiences with the Super Smash Bros. franchise have been somewhat odd. I never owned any of the games through my childhood. I played Melee once briefly at a friend's house and borrowed Brawl from another friend, but only to play through Subspace Emissary. And even then I barely even understood the controls the whole way through, never even realising there were attacks other than special moves. So when Ultimate was announced in one of the best directs I've ever seen, I was very excited to find out what I had been kinda sorta but not really missing out on all of these years, and I really enjoyed the whole hype cycle leading up to this game, even watching every weekly Game Explain discussion leading up to it. I got into watching lots of Smash 4 YouTubers at that time, and even though I wasn't playing it, Smash had become a big part of my life. Then the game came out, and I barely played it. Yeah, I realised that even after plenty of practice, I'm not exactly all that good at the game, as my videos can attest, and there are other games I generally prefer to play over it, even though I still have plenty of fun most times, I do happen to pick it up. So why is Ultimate even on my list? Because it still enriches many other parts of my life. It turns out I enjoy watching my favourite YouTubers play the game a lot more than I enjoy playing it myself. So much so, that the vast majority of the YouTube content I watch is Smash content. And I spend a probably slightly unhealthy amount of time watching YouTube, so Smash is actually responsible for providing me with most of my recreational activities, despite not playing it much. What's more, when I go on my runs through the local countryside, I use Ultimate's sleep mode music playing feature to listen to my favourite energetic tracks. Gotta say, I absolutely adore that music playing feature, to the point I wish each and every Switch game had the same thing, can't tell you how happy that would make me. Since I made my video about Pokemon Sword, I was made painfully aware of the general consensus on the quality of this game. People think it's bad. From what I gather, many previous entries in the franchise were far superior, and this game is very stripped down with a lacklustre story and very little effort put into the graphical design. As this was my first ever and so far only Pokemon game, I'm absolutely not the person to discuss its objective quality in comparison to the other games, I have no point of reference. These issues, however, don't detract from my own positive experiences with this game. I played through most of Pokemon Sword on a family holiday, a family holiday that turned out to be very stressful for me for reasons I shan't disclose here. But Pokemon turned out to be the main thing on that holiday that helped me hold on to my sanity, and actually have some fun. I was playing Pokemon for the first time, and it was a very personal experience for me. I really connected with the game in a way I seldom did anymore, this felt like a truly fresh experience. I loved Galar, the game's region that was based on my home country of England, all the footpaths and countryside vistas and little details as simple as the bins and signposts reminded me of where I live. Well, I suppose except for that weird rocky deserty area, but that doesn't matter. I loved the wild area, I loved Hop, and really wished the game focused more on him. In fact, I wish the whole game were doubles battles with Hop as a party member, I felt guilty every single time I was forced to beat him and lower his self-esteem even further. And I loved catching various Pokemon, many of whom I'd never seen before, naming them and forming a bond with them. 
I love all the Pokemon that help me on my journey. There's Diddy Kungas, Earl Grey, Pale Death, Spooky Noodle, Freaky Toad, Not Nemo, Hodgepodge, Bitey McSnap, Arceus, Moto Moto, Gloria, Farticus, Chonky Chonk, Howard, Bolapair, Gus, and of course, the objectively best Pokemon of all time, Cheeks the Greedent. I love that chubby squirrel so much, isn't she just the cutest? Sword and Shield may not be as objectively good as other Pokemon games, but so far as I'm concerned, it's my favourite. I had an all-round fun time. Oh, and I desperately need at least Olina's theme in Smash, it's so good! The next game on the list is one you won't be expecting. Seriously, this is the kind of game that you've probably either never heard of, or immediately disregarded almost the exact moment you heard of it. That game is Sushi Striker The Way of Sushido. Sushi Striker is a game where you use the touchscreen to line up sushi on plates of the same colour, eating said sushi, and flinging said plates at your opponent enough to win battles. You play as Musashi, an orphan who fights alongside a legendary sushi sprite, a being capable of somehow producing infinite amounts of sushi, named Jinrai against the corrupt empire who hoard the sushi sprites to themselves and make it illegal for most to eat it. How on earth these people manage to eat such copious amounts of sushi without literally exploding is beyond me. Okay, let all that sink in. No, I did not have a stroke whilst writing that part of the script. That's the actual synopsis. And it's only the tip of the absurdity iceberg. It was the sheer lunacy of the game's premise that moved me to try the demo for this game in the first place. But then I was really impressed by how fun the game really was. The combat was fun and satisfying, although on the surface it seems very much like a simple mobile phone time wastery game. In fact, there's strategy in what sushi sprites, prepared item, lane drive gear, and favourite sushi you use, and the combat gets more and more complicated and engaging as you progress and new elements are added. The plot is actually quite gripping, with several key twists and mysteries slowly uncovered, and the characters and comedic writing in this game is so well done, it made me laugh out loud surprisingly often, and there's even a goodly amount of fully animated cutscenes that are just a joy to watch. I love how well this game just embraces its ridiculous premise, absolutely overflowing with great comedic writing and charm, and the music is a real joy to listen to, it's so well done. There was so much effort and heart put into this game, it makes me sad that it was so overlooked. A big part of why hardly anyone gave it a chance is likely how expensive it was upon release. It was fully priced when all most people thought it was, was a mobile game quality little time waster. It's a lot cheaper now, so I urge you to give it a try. At least give the gem- the gemo. I was just gonna say it, give the gemo a dough. No, give the demo a go. There we go. This is kind of funny, so I'm leaving, I'm leaving it in the video. For me, it was very much worth the chance. It does, however, make me really hungry for sushi. Among the games I originally bought my Switch with was a game overflowing with charm that no one saw coming. I'm talking about Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle, and my initial reaction to hearing about the game went something like this. Crazy rabbits, random sky portal, why? Screw it, I got arm cannons now! When I started playing this game, I had just been through an extremely miserable part of my life. So playing through this game not only felt like a really fun, fresh new experience, but it also marked the first time I'd really felt any happiness for months. My first playthrough felt joyful, hopeful, and freeing. It started a big trend for me of having new and unexpected experiences as my favourite games on the Switch, and it felt as if a whole new world of games and possibilities had opened up to me. So, yes, anyway, time to talk about the actual game. Honestly, where do I even begin with this game? It came so far out of left field, and yet I fell so absolutely in love with it. And there's a lot to cover. Naturally, the first mode I played was the story campaign, and let me tell you, this thing is pure gold. The opening cinematics alone are amazing, but the whole journey is brimming with comedy and creativity. The whole Mushroom Kingdom is covered in enormous objects from the real world, and you're constantly coming across rabbits in the background, doing various goofy things, and Beepo always has some amusing comment to make on whatever's going on. 
I adore the world design and the character design and the graphical style makes all the environments and characters really pop and come alive. But of course, the real meat of the game is found in its combat, which is unlike anything I've ever played before and is extremely well made. Over the course of the game you unlock 8 different characters, Mario, Luigi, Peach, Yoshi and rabid versions of each, who all have their own charm, abilities and personalities. Personally I like rabid Mario, he plays a mean loot and I love his overall cocky macho attitude, just look at him standing there beating his chest, it just says come at me, attack if you've got the guts. And each of these characters come with their own weapons and sub weapons. You can buy and equip new weapons, upgrade your characters with their skill trees, and only being able to have three active party members at any time means you need to strategize which ones will be most effective in each battle. I had lots of fun mixing and matching teams and finding strategies that worked for me. Although unfortunately you are always required to have Mario and at least one rabbit on your team. That felt like an unnecessary restriction. And that's all before we mention the battles themselves. But well, this portion of the video is kind of turning into a mini review at this point, so I'll just say the battle system is amazing, deep and super fun and engaging. But as great as the story campaign is, the mode I actually ended up spending the most time on was the 2 player competitive mode. This mode is way more fun than you'd expect for a little side mode, and I've said mode too many times, it's getting weird. I adore the slow paced tactics of this game, and the versus mode streamlines it further by limiting you to 3 action tickets. Good for one movement, weapon, use or jump each. Sure there are all sorts of gimmicky stuff like items you can turn on, but I prefer a more competitive rule set. Using this game's battle mechanics to strategize against another person makes the combat way more engaging. It's honestly so fun, and I'm so disappointed that this mode never got any updates! Only the four stages the game launched with, and they didn't even add Donkey Kong or Rabid Cranky after the DLC came out. The DLC is good too, by the way. I really want a sequel where loads of Mushroom Kingdom stuff spreads over the rabbit world instead of vice versa, and you get to play as the genius inventor girl from the opening cutscene who invented the game's primary MacGuffin. As a huge Mario fangirl, I'm sure she would have loved the adventure Beepo got to go on. I absolutely adore this kooky game that came so out of left field, featuring a crossover between Mario and essentially the minions of video games, and it was actually really, really good. It stuck out in my mind as almost the best game on the Switch that I've played. But before we get to number one, we have some honourable mentions. These are entries to several series of games that have been excellent, if not the best iterations of their respective series, but simply didn't resonate with me as much as the games that made the cut. Games like Super Mario Odyssey, Splatoon 2, and Animal Crossing New Horizons. There's also several games that were new experiences for me, and I absolutely loved playing them, but they were on all sorts of other consoles and I didn't really have enough to say about them. The first draft of this video was... cumbersome. These games include Deltarune Chapter 1, Rest of the Game Please Soon Toby, It's Been Almost Two Years, Katamari Damacy Reroll, and Steven Universe Save the Light, which, as an existing Steven Universe fan, I adored every inch of that game. From its gorgeous art style, its engaging and fun battle mechanics, references to the show, humour and delightful music. Seriously, give that a play, it's great. There's also Paper Mario the Origami King, which I haven't quite finished at the time of writing, so I don't have a fully formed opinion on it yet, but thus far I'm loving it and we'll get to work on a fully fledged review video for it once this video is done, so subscribe if you want to see that. Let me tell you a story. It is a tale of adventure, mystery and pure joy, but it is also a tale of sadness and great loss. Let me tell you about Octopath Traveller. Octopath Traveler really resonated with me and astounded me by its sheer quality in so many ways. From the stunningly gorgeous HD 2D graphical style to the deep and satisfying battles, eight main characters and their own mostly very enjoyable and gripping stories, ridiculously deep world building and lore, every NPC having all sorts of hidden information to discover, and a soundtrack that will blow you away with how absolutely incredible it is, just all the time! This is the kind of game I mean when I say I need the Smash Ultimate music player in other games. 
Also, I just want to mention real quick, there's this harp player called Samantha Ballard I really enjoy, and she's made some really beautiful harp versions of loads of Octopath Traveler songs. She even has an album. She has a much bigger channel than me, so shouting her out will most likely hardly benefit her at all, but go give her a listen anyway. I'll put a link in the description. All these elements blend together masterfully to create a grand adventure made up of eight smaller adventures that deeply moved me and kept me engaged for the 100 plus hours it took to beat it. Each traveller goes on their own adventure and have their own story and emotional journey. Let's talk about all of them because I don't feel like I'm doing the game justice without giving you a good synopsis and stuff. <gasps> There's Olberic, whose story is my favourite, a semi-retired legendary warrior who goes on a quest to both uncover the truth of why his best friend and comrade betrayed his former homeland and killed his king, and to figure out why he even wields his blade anymore. The chapters of his story often really shake up the formula they usually follow in this game. He even ends up on friendly terms with most of the antagonists he faces, which I really liked. He's stoic and noble, but also very contemplative and has a lot of passion deep down. There's Cyrus, a scholar who has to venture out to clear his name and, um, track down a lost book. His story is my least favourite if I'm honest, but I really like his character. He's the perfect blend of impeccable intelligence and totally oblivious dumbassery. And I always love characters with a proper speaking manner and a truly comprehensive grasp on the English language, not shying away from being somewhat loquacious using larger words. There's Tressa, the first character I started with, a budding merchant who moves out of her parents' house to travel the land and hone her craft. Out of all the travellers, her story feels the most adventurous, and the most inspiring to me as I'd lived a pretty sheltered life, and was just then starting to realise the appeal of venturing out on my own journeys. This game really ignited an adventurous, independent spirit in me. Tressa is lovable, a bit naive at first, and sassy, and her story is much more light-hearted and often comical than the other characters, who often deal with very heavy and dark themes. There's Ophelia, a cleric going on a pilgrimage in her sister's stead so she can be beside their dying father's side. There are a lot of really touching emotional moments in her story. Ophelia is a member of the Cinnamon Roll Club. There's Primrose, a dancer who's on a quest to get revenge on the men who murdered her father when she was a child. By far the darkest story the game has to offer. There's Alfin, an apothecary and president of the Cinnamon Roll Club, who ventures out to help the people of the world with his medicine. Overall, another of my favourite stories in the game. I love his home village of Clearbrook. His second chapter has some really touching moments where he helps a poor family cure one of his daughters, and he faces a rival apothecary who's legitimately one of the most despicable people I've ever encountered in a video game. And in chapters 3 and 4, he has to deal with some really interesting moral dilemmas regarding his initial wish to offer medical care to anyone and everyone. When I first started his story in one of the game's demos, I was camping in the Lake District with some of my family. As I walked through several real-life, beautiful, foresty, rivery areas, it further immersed me in the similar, also beautiful areas in the game, making me appreciate it all the more. There's Therion, a thief and resident edgelord. He gets duped into helping Lady Cordelia get her stolen dragonstones back. His second chapter is probably the most boring part of the game, but the, through the rest of his story you find out more about his and Cordelia's past, and betrayals by people they thought were their friends, and over the story they bond and help each other heal. But what about the sadness and loss I mentioned at the outset of this overly lengthy section of this video? Well, unfortunately, my personal experiences with the game weren't all positive. The one traveller I'm yet to mention, Harnet, was one I decided to save until a family holiday in the forest, because it was thematic to where she lives and where her story begins, the quiet woodland tribe of Swaki. I decided I'd finish up to every other character's third chapter, and then progress no further until after starting a second file with Harnet as my main protagonist. Playing a game on a holiday always makes it feel more meaningful and memorable to me, and I wanted this final story I began to feel special. So I sat, on a bench in the woods, enjoying Hunnit's first chapter on her new file. Eventually, I reached a save point, mashed A like I always did to save, and... saved over my original file, with over 100 hours of playtime on it. 
Unfortunately, the way Octopath Traveler save files work is when you start a new one and pick a first traveler to be your main protagonist, you're not attached to any specific save file yet. Ergo, the first time when you save on a new file, it defaults you to the top of the list, and sadly, my existing file was in file number one. If I was paying more attention and was aware this was how it worked, I would have saved on one of the eight other unused files, and all would have been well. But I didn't. And it wasn't. I was mortified. I was furious. It ruined my holiday, and I didn't play the game again for months. I had gotten so invested in the fantastic journey this game took me on, fell in love with the game's world and characters, I felt a real connection to each traveller and their stories, only to have everything I'd done torn away from me and erased in mere moments. However, my love for this game burned brighter than my sorrow. Eventually, I again picked up the game, started another file again with Tressa as my starter, and completed it, even up to the secret final superboss. Even after such loss, my passion for this game still reawakened, and I continue to adore every moment I played it. This game is special to me. It inspired and moved me more than a game had since I was a child, something I never thought possible. Sure, it's long, and to some the structure of eight different stories may make the experience feel unfocused and difficult to get truly invested in, but for me this was a spectacular experience from beginning to end. And though my journey had a rather sad middle, I can't wait for the eventual sequel. Thank you ever so much for listening to this very opinionated, personal video about my favourite Switch games. This truly has been an odd console generation for me, as a Mario nerd, there was only one Mario game on this list! But I want to know your thoughts, the people responsible for me reaching 200 subscribers. What are your favourite Switch games? And if you're new, and clearly interested in my opinion enough to watch this far, please consider subscribing, because once I reach 300 subscribers, I'll be making my top 5 favourite Wii U games, and as I pass more and more milestones, I'll be working my way backwards through the consoles I've played, all the way back to the GBA. So thank you one and all for watching, and until next time, farewell everyone.